So we are going to be studying Proverbs chapter 6 and 7 today. And it's a simple study, nothing complicated, uh, not too academic or intense. We'll just see what we can glean through it in the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes. Okay. So I'll read from, uh, and uh, we'll go along as we read. So Proverbs chapter 6 and 7, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, if you have been trapped by what you said, instead ensnared by the words of your mouth, so do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Okay, so this uh, verse 1 to 5 is one section talking about if you have either knowingly or unknowingly, mm, maybe the circumstances under which you did it were good or, or bad, but looks like it is not a very good situation right now, right? So you have set up security for your neighbor. So on behalf of your neighbor, you have pledged something, you know, to cover him, protect him, or uh, provide for him, so on and so forth. So uh, looks like you have reached a very difficult situation. And, you know, uh, talks here also about your stranger. So here's two things, neighbor and stranger. So sometimes in life, we do make mm, partnerships or business deals or relationships, or we sign up for a contract, or sign up for a football team, or whatever it is, you know, and we make a partnership with uh, certain people. And at that time, maybe it seems to be a very good uh, idea, you know, but uh, there comes a time in life when you realize that these uh, relationships that you've built, especially from a professional or a social perspective, are not good, and it's not healthy, and maybe even damaging for you. So what he's saying is, instead of staying, staying prideful, you know, and, you know, gritting through it, there comes a time when you need to give up, a time to surrender, a time to say that you can't manage it. And so to do that, uh, what uh, Saul, uh, Paul, Solomon here is saying is, you should humble yourself, you know, because there's your humility, maybe it takes a beating, it takes a bashing, I'm uh, sorry, your pride takes a beating and a bashing, but it is good for you. It is better for the long run. So in a way, you're talking about humility, humbling yourself, and uh, so that the long run is you're free. Okay. So let's read it again. Verse 2, it says, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. So this is something that you were not forced into. You were not coerced into. Uh, nobody probably threatened you into it. It's just that you made this decision. Maybe there was a psychological or emotional uh, pressure, but ultimately you, you, you walked into it. You know. So for two steps is one thing is number one is, Here's a warning to be careful about uh, relationships and plans and uh, projects and you know things that you make with other people. Be very careful, first of all. Prayfully decide and make these choices. Make these bonds with people. And uh, if by chance you have made these and you fall into difficult and tough circumstances, then what it says is you have to humble yourself and you go to the point of exhaustion. right? Even nag your neighbor and uh, beg for release. Okay. Uh, this could come from a social perspective, even from a spiritual perspective. And if I may speak about the spiritual perspective, maybe, you know, maybe you are going through intense... Okay, one more entry. Welcome. Um, see, like there was a woman who was supposedly demonized. Okay. And she was from a very uh, prim and proper family. A lady in every form of understanding and uh, when she saw that people who are being you know exorcised who are being cleansed they were making a embarrassment of themselves so to speak you know lying on the floor because of course when an evil spirit comes out of you uh they will be screaming sometimes they will be screaming and shouting there will be there could be a certain loss of control or whatever it is there is certain form of indignity so when she looked at that she said that no you know i, I can't do that i am a you know from a small child, from my family background, I've been brought up in a very dignified and respectful environment. And I can't allow myself to be seen like this, falling down and screaming and, you know, losing control. I would rather have the evil spirit within me. You know? So that is a bondage also that some people have. They, they look for self-respect so much and for social, you know, 
uh, recognition and uh, they don't want to lose control that they're not even willing to uh, let go of that unclean thing or a habit or a person or relationship in their life. It's stubbornness and it's evil and it's pride to the fullest extent. So the pastor went to her and said, that, you know, you may lose your dignity for a few moments, but you'll be free forever. So and many times we also need to be, you know, consider that aspect as well. Because, you know, when I pastored, when we're pastored, and you might have seen also, when people come, broken people come to church and uh, maybe hear a sermon or a message or receive word of counsel, there is a, there happen, they do cry. You know, people do cry. They break down. Uh, I'm not saying sling and falling down and, you know, rolling on the floor. No, no. Just to, to be emotionally, publicly, emotionally released. It's, it can be very embarrassing for many people. No. But when that happens, is when, see, one thing I've realized in life is nobody really cares about you. Yeah. Especially when I counsel young people, I tell them that you know, they are more concerned about themselves and what other people think of them than you they being concerned about you. They, are, they don't really care about what you look like, you know, what where you are from, so on and so forth. They're more concerned about their own image, you know, about their own well-being. So especially when we come for prayer and, and advice and you know healing and such things. Uh, don't worry about the indignity, you know, the so-called indignity that you might go through to receive your healing, to receive your release. And so in a way, I would also encourage you that, yes, uh, so what if you lose your dignity or your self-respect for a moment, but if it is for your release, you know, for your freedom from whatever bondage or uh, contract or bond that you may have made with somebody or something, now, it's better that you go through that than to continue to suffer under the control of these things, right? So I would say that in this aspect of verses 1 to 5, this is encouragement as well. See, like imagine, free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. So this is a very precious encouragement from many aspects. And, uh, and there is no shame, right? To experience a little bit of difficulty for a moment so that you receive a long-term release and relief. You know, like just now our sister Rebecca was sharing, right? A little bit, yes. It is a bit embarrassing to say that, uh, you know, you have not finished your homework and you have a lot of pressure. But now that you're doing it and you've received encouragement and prayer, you know, now you, you will receive God's strength and help to be able to do that, you know, in, in a small example. So uh, don't be ashamed because we're all here to help each other, right? We love each other. We care for each other. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's good to share because, you know, as a counselor, again, let me say this. Um, many times we think we are so alone. You know, may I have counseled hundreds of people. Many of them think they're alone. They're suffering. Nobody understands them. Nobody comprehends the situation. And, you know, uh, they are, their stroller, sorrows are very unique and special. And I'll tell you this, that no, it's not special. It's not unique. Because Bible says that it's all suffering is common to man, you know. So, for example, you may have suffered a failure in school and you think you're the only one that know. There are hundreds of people who have gone through that. And so when you come to a counselor, when you share that with somebody, the same person said, oh, you know, I went through that same experience 10 years ago. But look at me, 10 years from now, I didn't even remember it. You know, God has helped me and I've moved on with my shame, my embarrassment, my humiliation, my suffering. You know, so it's very good to be able to share, of course, in a loving environment. Don't just go around sharing with anybody, random person. But uh, there are a few people you know around you, like your mentors, your aunts, your uncles, your teachers, your certain your people around you who will be able to lovingly guide you and go, uh, and mentor you and counsel you. So it is good to be able to share because there are many people who have gone to similar situations and they've come up victorious. And so it's very wonderful to hear their testimony, you know, and their stories to encourage you and to show you that, yes, there is a way out. Okay. So in short, it's a, uh, it's a very precious yeah, in uh, lesson and encouragement and yeah, let's follow through on that. Next, verse 6 onwards, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food, food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief. And scarcity like an armed man. So here is a lesson against uh, laziness, against laid backness, against uh, passivity, right? Uh, sluggard, very strong word, sluggard. Somebody who does not, you know, take care of himself, forget about taking care of others. He is laid back, he is 
he's lazy, he's slow, he does not see the sense in being, you know, efficient and wise and hardworking. So what what does he, what does Solomon say? He says, go to the ant, go look at nature, right? He says, consider its ways and be wise. Consider, think, ponder, look at them. Like yesterday, a few days ago, I found uh, somebody had uh, cut up some beehive. Okay, they're taking all the bee, uh, the honey, but they're thrown a portion of the hive on the ground. I picked it up and put it in the corner. And guess what? Ants, two, three varieties of ants came and started cleaning the hive. Now, uh, I didn't call them. I didn't invite them. Nobody sent a, in, an invitation letter or WhatsApp call. But they, they kept hunting and searching and they came and now they've been eating all the honey, the leftover honey, as well as all the, of course, the larvae and, you know, the dead bees and all that. And uh, it's helping us also. It's cleaning up our yard, right? And I'm thinking of extracting the beeswax from it later once they've cleaned up the whole thing. So, uh, yeah, look at the uh, ants. Wonderful. See, it has no commander, no overseer or ruler, right? Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food, food at harvest. It knows exactly you know, uh, when to take care of itself and its family. So the ant, as we saw in verse 6 honors, is not a solitary animal. It's a, it's a creature that uh, takes care of each other, takes care of its colony, takes care of uh, the environment around it, and also helps many others like me, you know, cleaning the garden. So uh, what we, what's the encouragement here is when we live productively, right? let me read further, verse 9. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little slumber and a, a little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcely like an armed man. So don't think that, you know, uh, yes, God is merciful and gracious, but we are supposed to work, right? We're all in families. All of us are working. So this is encouragement for everyone. Uh, uh, we will continue to work till we die. But thanks be to the Lord Jesus, right? We have fruitfulness. We can receive fruitfulness and productivity and abundant blessing in our life, especially when we call upon the name of the Lord, right? Um, I'll give you a small example. One of my friends, one man missionary in uh, in Masuri, right? he bought a piece of land and he was he bought a nice little orchard and uh, he started, uh, you know, putting manure and weeding it and cleaning it and and praying for a big harvest. But for a season. No matter how much he worked, okay, no fruit was coming. No help was there in the in the fruits, and there was just no um, productivity in his garden. Okay, I think it went on for one or two or some three years, and uh, he was wondering, you know, he, have, he has brought in uh, gardeners and he has put manure and he's done all the kind of labor. And one reason the previous owners probably sold it to him because it was an unfruitful ground, right? So they said that nothing is growing here. Why, why why should he invest in it? And they sold it to this guy. So this guy bought it. And uh, nothing also happened to him, right? So in a sense, many times in life, we work and we slaver and we, we slog also, yeah, but there's no productivity. And so one day he was sitting on his garden and he was prayerfully thinking, you know, asking the Lord, what is, why is this not uh, prospering? And uh, he heard a prayer, he heard a voice and uh, it says, you know, repent the sins of the previous owners. Repent of what they have done in this land. And it was a very unusual thing he heard, but he kept hearing it. So he said, okay, why not? Let's give it a shot. So now he said, I am the new owner of this land. And I, in the name of Jesus, I bless this land and I repent on the behalf of the previous owners from whatever, you know, sins may have they done over here. I ask for the blood of Christ to wash it away. And then he prayed and kept praying for some time. And guess what? Next year, he had, you know, like abundant harvest. So much fruits and vegetables came out on the land. So much that he started giving away to his neighbors for free also. And uh, it's been, you know, prospering like that for a long time. So, uh, yes, there is a season when we have to work. And uh, sometimes we have to ask the Lord. And when as Christians we work, you know, remember that we can ask the Lord directly. And our fruit will be much more abundant uh, than those who do not ask the Lord. You know, maybe you've never asked for God's blessing in your study, in your work, in your career. Yeah, you're a believer of the Lord. You're very working very hard, but maybe you're never really asked. So I encourage you to specifically ask, you know, uh, for the young students here, ask, you know, Lord, bless me in my maths. Bless me in my Hindi. Help me to understand. Help me to comprehend. And yes, uh, don't be a sluggard, right? Don't say, that, okay, I've done it. And, you know, it's just going to happen miraculously. Uh, in such cases, there's no miracles. You have to really work 
do your part you do your part and god will do his part right like the same uh, gentleman he he put manure he put uh, you know divided he took a gardener he did his part and then god blessed his part so this is the encouragement that even especially as christians you no know, we must work and i would encourage you one more reason why one must we work because god is a worker okay and he made us to work we are made in the image of god and we will find fulfillment and joy in the work that we do and just as i mentioned about ants when the ants work not only the individual ants but the whole colony and the whole garden itself is cleaned up you know everybody benefits so this is why we must work and uh, learn lesson from the ants so that we become productive and uh, prosperous in everything we do yeah okay let's go verse 12 a troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth who winks maliciously maliciously with his eye signals with his feet and motions with his fingers who plots evil with deceit in his eyes he always stirs up conflict therefore disaster will overtake him in an instant he will suddenly be destroyed without remedy okay so let's look at this guy so here we talk he talks about a troublemaker and a villain so he just he's passing judgment over here who is a troublemaker who is a villain a troublemaker is somebody who goes out, out of his business right a busy body it's no concern of him but he goes poking his nose around in different places uh he may not be in one level a troublemaker he goes and you know beats, beats up someone trashes someone steals robs and kills or he looks for people to entice you know he wants to gang so he goes around gathering people around him he maybe uh you know he's got bad habits so he gathers people around him who's who's whom he wants to recruit into his bad habit you know those are such people uh and a villain is one of course who goes about uh, willfully doing evil and uh, what does it say he goes around and corrupt the mouth so he goes around proclaiming inviting enticing marketing his goods and his wares uh gossiping maybe slandering maybe uh praising unclean things uh looking for ways um you know so think about how these people work right uh also downplaying so supposing somebody comes to you and say that or you know he's in, invites you have a drink okay, let's let's go high school level college level i've been to college we've all most of us school college so i have had these friends in college who are like you know let's party let's drink let's this and that and when i said no i got class i got and then they will say don't worry i'll give you notes right i'll i'll help you with class i will uh, you know the teacher will be absent tomorrow so with his mouth he tries to undermine everything i am saying all the excuses i have they keep undermining so they have tricks and games you know methods to undermine all the solutions that one can offer so that is how a how corrupt their mouth can be he winks maliciously with his eyes so he signals with his eyes and you can see in his eyes also by the way so keep an eye out for people with their eyes signals with his feet motions with his fingers right and who plots evil with deceits in his heart so the whole body language look at the whole body language um i remember if i may uh there was one gentleman who which my family did some dealing and my brother used to say no i don't like this guy and i used to wonder why then he told me he never looks at me in the eye whenever i have a conversation with him whenever i talk to him about anything he doesn't look me in the eye he doesn't make eye contact and uh, you know he he seems to be very sly he doesn't talk to me he doesn't look at me he's always like that so but my family i mean you know the business went on later a couple of years later we found out that yes he was a very big cheat you know he robbed a lot of people and so we must look out for his signs as well look at the eyes look at the hands look at the feet now i have had people who is who wink a lot who make eye signals so on so forth and uh, oh, so keep an eye out for these things it's the encouragement here mm. it says what these people plot evil with deceit in their hearts he always stirs up conflict okay, so he's planning deceit in his heart so he's always thinking about these things he's always pondering and planning on how to hurt people and how to rob people and how to make the most of the circumstances and he stirs up conflict which means he is always looking for ways to fight and disrupt people not only around him but he goes out of his way to hurt people so watch out for these people is the encouragement number one is watch out number two is don't be that guy okay don't be that person because verse 15 he says therefore disaster will overtake him in an instant he will suddenly be destroyed without remedy right no remedy will be found for such people so they may seem to prosper let me uh, encourage you for 5 10 15 20 30 40 50, 50 years even these people may be prosperous and powerful and you know uh rich and healthy and appreciated in society but you know who they are within a few years with a few interactions you will know who they are 
So don't invade such people. Don't partner with such people because ultimately God will destroy them. God will destroy them till there is no remedy for such people. Okay, so beware. Don't be such people and beware of such people. Verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates. So this is a, a style in the Hebrew where, uh, you know, he says, okay, 16. Oh, and there's seven things. So this is a literary style. He says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Okay, number one, haughty eyes. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, number four, the, a heart that devises wicked schemes. Uh, number four, number five, feet that are quick to rush into evil. Six, a false witness who pours out lies. And seven, a person who stirs up conflict in a community. So here's a slight repetition from a previous person, the troublemaker and the villain. So let's, he's now going specifically about these things. Uh, number one, haughty eyes. So prideful eyes. When you look down on people mm, because of their age, their gender, their occupation, their background, their race, their culture, you know, basically you think more than yourself. So God hates haughty eyes. When you look down at any other human being, because remember this, we are all made in the image of God. We are all children of God. Each and every one of us are children of God. So uh, if you look down on anybody, we're looking down on God's creation, on, on somebody whom Jesus has died at the cross, right? Every human being, Jesus has died for that person. So if you look down at hot tears on someone, you're downplaying, their, their de you're devaluating their worth. So be careful. Uh, let us not be someone like that. Okay? A lying tongue, very clear. Because when we lie, we are against the God of truth. Right? God is the God of truth. So if we lie, we are anti-God almost. So don't lie about anything. Be on, uh, I remember many years ago, uh, one of our senior pastors, this is in the 90s, his wife, uh, the maid, the maid had a very uh, alcoholic, violent husband. Okay. So she used to come to, to the house every once in a while for help. One day it got so bad, she ran away and she came to the house and uh, they put her in a safe house somewhere. Okay. Somewhere. And so the husband came and demanding where, you know, demanding his wife to know where his wife was. And uh, my, the pastor's wife was telling me very clearly, you know, when the man came demanding where his wife was, he she did not say, okay, she had the boldness and the courage and the security also, and the conviction, she did not say, no, I don't know where she is. She never came here. Go look somewhere else, right? She, in such a circumstance, she could have said that. Many people would have said that. You know? But what she said was, yes, she came here and we have hidden her safely. We will not tell you where she is, right? Because you're going to hurt her and harm her until this issue is resolved, till you receive counseling, whatever. We will not tell you. We will not, till you calm down, we will not tell you where she is until you promise not to beat her up and so on and so forth, right? So this is a small example, but about lying, no? So uh, they had every opportunity to lie, even for a good cause, I would say this, even for a very good reason. They had every opportunity to lie. But they said, we will not lie and we will not tell you where it is. So silence. Right, you, We know where she is, but we will not lie to you. So even for good reasons, you know, for good cause, we shouldn't lie as well. Right? And if you are beaten for the truth, great. You know, God will reward you for that. Okay. So a lying tongue. Next is hands that shed innocent blood. So uh, remember, it doesn't say only murder, but shedding innocent blood. So it could be, yes, downright murder tormenting people, abusing people, and, you know, destroying their life and the quality of life. But also sometimes it could be out of neglect, out of your duty and your responsibility as well. For example, right now, uh, bridges are falling, buildings are collapsing, you know, people are drowning because of mismanagement uh, of corruption, right? So that also extends into that area as well. You send people to war, you, 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 you know, you... Uh, instigate someone to go and fight with someone and these people go and beat each other up. So you may not be the one directly murdering someone, but you, but we could be uh, instrumental in creating situations where people go and harm each other. So this also can extend to that much. So God hates that, right? Next, a heart that devises wicked schemes, right? So we can talk about uh, not only planning and hurting people, uh, outright mm, like robbing someone of their house robbing someone in a car you know uh, how to entice someone to do drugs or alcohol how to all that stuff is there so we know what that is so a heart that with devices wicked schemes and remember this this heart has not yet done anything okay but it is devising 
So if you are spend your time and energy pondering on how to do evil, then you have already committed evil in heart by wasting your time and energy and filling yourself with impure thoughts. Right? I remember once upon a time, I mean, there was a movie that came out where uh, it was a movie scene where this murderer, okay, he takes petrol and uh, he takes it in the pipe and then he, you know, he inserts it into this uh, ticket seller's uh, boot and then he blows the petrol into the ticket seller's boot and then he sets the person on fire and the person, of course, catches fire and burns inside that boot. And what happened? Many people saw that and some people even emulated that, you know. So they went and literally did that and some people died because of this. And uh, there are many people, you know, who watch movies, you know, uh, not only violent movies, but perverse movies and videos and so on and so forth nowadays even. And they go and replicate these sinful acts, these filthy things. So uh, that category of people can also fall into this because you're devising, because, you know, you, you're gaining knowledge of evil things by watching things and spending your time instead of productively on things. So this is also the kind of people that God hates. Next is feet that are quick to rush into evil. Right? Feet that are quick to rush into evil. So imagine again. I mean, remember again. It's not only people who do evil, but also who plan evil, who think evil. Okay? And then the people who go into and do evil. So if you are someone who are who is ready to do evil, then of course God hates that. And uh, we should not be around people who, who rush into evil. So verse 18, verse 19. Verse 19, a false witness who pours out lies. God hates that as well. A false witness, somebody who's, you may not have committed the crime, you may not have uh, instigated it or planned it or prepared it, but you saw it happen. You're a wit, you're an innocent bystander. You saw something happen. But now you have the opportunity to speak the truth, right? You have this opportunity to say what really happened. But maybe you're intimidated. Maybe you're threatened. Maybe you're lazy. Maybe you don't care. So what these people do is, they lie. So you testify the, the falsehood, right? I didn't see it. I wasn't there. Especially, small example, again, in school, you know, we many times we have this, not only because I was in school, but I was a school teacher as well, right? And I, I, you would have, we would have all experienced this. So you see kids doing naughty things and then either because of fear of being beaten up later or because of a self, false sense of uh, loyalty or a false sense of uh, teamwork or whatever, People, you know, they will, uh, kids will refuse to tell what happened, right? They'll keep quiet, right? Imagine, I mean, they will keep quiet or they will feign ignorance. So that sense is also, it is a lie. You are false testifying. If you say, I don't know what happened, but you actually saw it, you are false testifying. So God hates such people, right? And if you extend it as to well, uh, beyond it, we also have many false prophets, right? False teachers called cults. So you can start it, you can talk about this false witnessing from a small perspective on literally you saw something happen, an accident happened, someone beat someone, yes. But also if you testify falsehood, if you teach falsehood, all the way to starting cults, right? So uh, God hates such people. So he's putting that whole umbrella under these, this kind of uh, people. So don't uh, test it, because right now I'm telling you, especially even as a missionary and a pastor, for more than 20 years now, I have seen so many cults coming to Delhi. Right? So many cults are coming and they're giving false testimony about Jesus. Recently, there was one called a lightning. You know, uh, uh, Jesus came as a Chinese woman and she is living in China. And uh, you know, they've been, they've made this movie also, which is on YouTube. And they're all over the internet. All of them are falsely testifying that Jesus has come as a Chinese woman who is hiding in Italy right now. You know, then we have the Mormons, the Moonies, the, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, the so on and so forth. So many people testifying falsely about Christ is done or not done and uh, about things. So God hates that. That whole category of people. You know, false testimonies. Who pours out lies. Next is, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Right? So uh, repetition kind of from the previous guy. Uh, but a person who stirs up conflict. In a, so you stir up. You go around and instigate people. You say, this person this, said this and that and this and do this. He forgot. So on and so forth. Right, so you stir up in conflict. So uh, through gossip, maybe through false testimony, maybe or through false witnessing, or not speaking the truth, or uh, you know wickedly scheming that whole process. So we have to be very careful to not be amongst the company of such people. Right, bad company corrupts. We know this. So be careful of what you're filling yourself up with. 
and uh, what you're pondering over. Okay, let me repeat. It says you cannot. There's an idiom. There's a proverb that says what? You cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop a bird from building a nest on your head. Right. Right. So what are these uh, birds? These birds are temptations, evil ideas, evil concepts, evil habits, uh, filthy things. So these things will fly. They'll come and go. You'll have people around you. Or you'll see movies or whatever. Don't let them land and uh, build nests on your head is the encouragement over here. Okay. Now let's go to verse 20. Um, very important. This is about adultery because uh, let's, let's, let's see. My son, keep your father's command. Solomon says, my son, keep your father's command. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. So it talks about both the mother and father are very important. And both, if you are a father and a mother here, and one day you will be a father and a mother, remember both of you are equally responsible for teaching your children. Okay, Don't relegate it. Again, I'll tell you, as a school teacher, I've seen hundreds and thousands of children where the parents are absent in their life. Their parents will say, I've given the payment to the school, then the school teacher's responsibility to you know teach my children everything about life. And the father and the mother, sometimes both parents also are absent in their life. They'll say, ha, ha, good morning, good evening. And then they won't see them the whole day. So when you talk about morality and ethics as well, not only I'm not talking about science and, you know, uh, you know, all these uh, information stuff. But uh, when you, the parents' responsibility is yes to teach morals and ethics, as well as oh, the meaning of love and fellowship and relationship and social responsibility and all these things. So remember, as parents, it is our responsibility to teach our children. Okay. Uh, and let me also specify. <clears throat> in, in here it says father's commands. And it says mother's teachings. Okay. So father commands you to do things, right? We have that responsibility, that privilege. Father has a certain uh, leadership. Yeah. Not certain. He has leadership responsibility in the family. So he's supposed to command. And when he commands you as children, as godly fathers and godly children, we must give godly commands and godly children must obey these godly commands from a godly attitude. Mother is supposed to teach every good and wonderful skill as well. Now let's go. Verse 21. Bind them all as on your heart, fasten them around your neck. So even today, many Jews in Jewish culture, they'll literally take a box and they'll write Bible verses and then they'll take a leather tongue or a rope and then tie them on their uh in the foreheads, on their sides, and their arms, in the neck, so on and so forth. Uh, of course, doesn't mean literally, okay. Uh, but it's a metaphor, metaphorical, you know, encouragement, which means bind them to your heart. So all the teachings of your parents, and this is this is of course expecting that your parents are godly people and they're wise people and they're well versed in the scripture, which we must be, right? All of us should be. And so once if our godly parents teach us, then bind them to our hearts. Our heart is the seat of all our Decision making, right? Our heart seen center of our passion, center of our uh, uh, goals, you know, our uh, treasures in our heart. So it says, bind them to your heart, pass them around your neck because the neck is the part where all, of course, your blood, your air, your oxygen is, this, is the center of your movement, of the life giving stuff in your life, in your body. Of, 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 and also, it's the physically, it turns your head here and there, right? So if you fasten it to your neck, now, there's a certain direction that you cannot turn. So it's also speaking about that. Then he says, uh, when you walk, they will guide you. Yeah. When you sleep, they will watch over you. Okay. He's talking about the whole pattern of life. When you walk, they will guide you. Take this part, don't take this part. Go to the door, don't go to this door. Make this friendship, relationship, project, uh, employment, so on and so forth. Uh, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. means you will be able to sleep in peace. You will know sleep you will sleep secure knowing that you made the right decisions, the right choices, and you have, you are, you know, you're in the right place. When you wake, you will, he, they will speak to you. So when you wake up, from the moment you wake up, the wisdom and the knowledge of your parents, of your godly parents will continue to guide you. Right? Okay. So for this, for this command, verse 23, for this command is a lamp. The teaching is a light. And uh, in today's culture, we may not think much about lamp and light especially with all this electronics and, you know, uh, torches and everything around us. But in the olden culture, even just 50 years ago, electricity and light, lamp bulbs and so on and so forth were very uh, difficult to procure and, and expensive. And, you know, in the time of Jesus, you wouldn't even leave your house at night. The moment the sun goes down, 
all life kind of ends in the village. And because the only source of light is either wood lamps or your stove or oil lamps. And oil was expensive, you know. And you wouldn't go out of your house unless there's some big emergency. And uh, so what he's saying here is this command is a lamp. It lights the room around you, right? It shows you everything where it is and where it's supposed to be or where is what not supposed to be also, right? So it reveals things to you, exposes things to you. This teaching is a light. It shows you what should be, what should not be. And correction and instructions are the way to life. And corrections and instructions are the way to life. Okay, so corrections and instructions. So corrections, of course, means that you made a mistake. So they will correct you. Instructions mean this is the way to do it. So uh, step by step guidance on how to accomplish something are the way to life. Okay. Uh, keeping you from the neighbor's wife. Okay. Now this is a very pertinent topic as well, especially for young men, for, for all men and even for women to be beware. Okay. And especially one day as fathers and mothers, as grandparents also, and of course, as uh, cultural leaders, deacons and elders and, you know, church members, uh, social members, we need to be aware of this because this is what destroys nations. Yeah, this is what destroys families, destroys communities, destroys companies, destroys so much. What is it? One of the greatest sin. Keeping you from your neighbor's wife. So this whole this instruction so far from your father and your mother is specifically in this context from your neighbor's wife. From the smooth way of a wayward woman. From the smooth talk of a wayward woman. So look at it both ways. Don't be that person and beware of this person. Okay, verse 25. Do not lust in your eyes after her beauty. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. Okay. So somebody once said that, you know, what will happen if after I marry you, I fall in love with somebody else or I find, find someone more beautiful, more attractive. And the thing is, no, you will find others more beautiful and more attractive once you get married. But the point is marriage is a vow. See, it's a decision that you will stand by each other all your life. My point is, they are more beautiful, more handsome, more eligible people all your life. But once you get married, or even before you get married, I, in, I let me encourage you, young people here especially, that God already has someone special for you. God is, in, in fact, now all of most of you, some of you are in your 20s and 30s, God already has someone. That person is born right now. No, definitely you will not marry a baby. You're too old for that. Uh, that person is alive, roaming around the world somewhere, doing something, going about business. Right, studying or working or whatever. So pray for that person, you know, and uh, prepare yourself to be that eligible person for that person. You know, we all say, "I want a perfect person for my life," but doesn't that perfect person also deserve a perfect person? So you prepare yourself. You know, be be well taught, be well mannered, uh, get a job, be well educated, be godly, uh, have your ethics, your morality, your all that in place. Okay. So, so that when these temptations come later in life, you will not be captivated. You will not fall astray. <coughs> okay, let's go further. Let's move through this quickly because uh, it's very important. But uh, yeah, do not lust in your heart after her beauty or, or let her captivate you with her eyes, especially for young men and with the internet age. Be careful of what you watch. They are the windows to your soul. Uh, for a prostitute can be, for a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread. Okay. But um, another man's wife preys on your very life. You're just giving a spectrum. Right? Your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without uh, can a man without his clothes being burnt? So he's giving us uh, these um, contrasting you know, extreme examples. Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one that touches her will be un unpunished. Okay, so be careful because even for young men and women today, the person you might want to go around with as a boyfriend or girlfriend, he or she will be someone's husband or wife one day, right? Because there are no guarantees that you will marry that person. So yes, maintain distance, maintain a space. Well, I encourage most, I mean, all young people. Yeah, if you're interested in someone, you want to date someone, fine, but do it in a public setting. Maintain boundaries. Definitely physical boundaries, but also very important emotional boundaries, right? Maintain emotional boundaries. Maintain that aloofness in the space. Yes, it's fine to go and have fun and, you know, uh, in a public setting, go, go for group dates, go in a, you know, a public program, hang out, sure. But never be alone. Never allow yourself to, you know, 
allow both of yourself to be in compromising situations ever, especially if you're in the church. Especially, of course, we all in the church. But I encourage you, you know, be careful because you will burn someone, burn yourself and that other person. And it's a very sad thing, uh, a very sad thing because these damages can last forever. Okay, there'll always be some regrets in your life, and it'll bitter the water for your future. So encouragement for unmarried, and even for the married, of course. Now let's carry on. Mm. Verse 29, I'll, for 29, I'll repeat. So is he who sleeps with another man's wife, no one who touches her will go unpunished. Okay. Verse 30, people do, not, people do not despise a thief if he steals. To satisfy his hunger when he's starving. Yes, that's simple. Sometimes people steal because they're starving. They're starving to death. And they are a desperation for life. Okay, fine. We can understand that. Yet, if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. Yes, that is the old Jewish law. You will pay sevenfold. Though it costs him all the wealth of this of his wealth. So even if you steal someone because of your desperation, you will still have to pay consequences for this. There will, there will be consequences for this. But let's look at the contrast. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Because you don't... You know, it's not something that is desperate, right? It's not like water or bread or clothes even. That you need to go and steal and rob someone. This is a crime of lust, passion, an unnecessary problem that you're putting yourself into. So, whoever does so destroys himself because there's completely no sense in this. Blows and disgrace are his lot. Blows and disgrace are his lot and his shame will never be wiped away. Imagine, remember this, his shame will never be wiped away. And in today's culture, we wipe things away very clearly, but in divine biblical culture, it remains, of course, the blood of Christ will wash and cleanse and purify us, but Remember this. This is the degree of uh, what we're talking about. Blows and disgrace are his thought. You will be beaten. You will be humiliated. And your shame will never be wiped away. For, for jealousy arouses a husband's fury. And he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse a bribe, bribe however great it is. This is the, you know, the legal right even the husband has got. Because you have taken his wife. So if he comes and trashes you, beats you, humiliates you, kills you also, there is a <laughs> there is a certain uh, degree that is almost seems to be almost permissible under the law, right? Because it is there. In the Old Testament, if you commit adultery, you will be stoned to death. But be, forget about being stoned to death. Why do you want to destroy your life? Right? The future that you can have, the children that you can have. And uh, carrying on, we have uh, another 10 minutes, but this is the same thread in chapter 7. Let's go breeze through it, right? My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. And the apple of the eye means the iris, right? This is so precious. Uh, even if I flap, you know, my eyes close instantly. So what he's instructing us and encouraging us is take the commands and instructions of the Lord very seriously. Guard them. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Here's the repetition. We just read in verse 7. Bind them on your heads and on your neck. Right? Now he's saying, bind them on your fingers uh, and on your heart. Right? Um, say, to the, say to wisdom, you are my sister. And to insight, you are my relative. So you must give the invitation. This is encouragement to us. Right? It's an open invitation. You must make a relationship with wisdom and with insight. I hope you know the difference between wisdom. There's a slight difference. Uh, wisdom is knowing what to do. Insight is understanding what is happening. Insight means comprehending the situation. Right? You open your laptop and you look at it. You have no idea what it is. <laughs> but insight means you look at it and you say, oh, now I know that this is burnt and that is out of place. And wisdom is, of course, knowing what to do with that. Shall I go to the workshop and repair it? Or shall I fix it myself? Or shall I throw it my laptop? Right? So that is wisdom and insight. So you need both. Right? Wisdom to discern what is happening uh, uh, and, and what to do. And insight is similar. Understanding, comprehending the whole situation and circumstance. And but the point here is you must invite these three, these two into your lives. Yeah, and pray to God to give you specifically, I would say, when you pray, ask God for wisdom and insight. Name them by names and say, God, give me wisdom, give me insight. Yeah. Then he says, verse 5: They will keep you from the adulterous woman and from the wayward woman with the seductive words. Right? Words, be careful of words. Now, here's an illustration. I will breeze through it. At the window of my house, I looked down to the lattice. I saw among the among the simple. I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. 
So be careful, my boys. Don't go anywhere near there. Physically, as well as when you're scrolling. Avoid such places. The virtual world as well as the physical world. Avoid these places. Don't even go there. Say, so here's a simple young man, a foolish, stupid young man, going down that direction. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. So usually, yes, evil starts arousing itself at night, in the evenings. So beware, because our minds are also resting now, relaxing now. The day's work is over. We're looking for entertainment, relaxation, and rest. Be careful, especially of this time of the day. Then, out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet are never, uh, her feet never stay at home. So, yes, we can talk directly here about women, but we can talk about every kind of temptation under heaven as well. Right? Uh, now in the streets, now in the squares, and every corner she looks, see? Everywhere it is. Temptation, we cannot hide from it very easily. We go to school, we go to college, we go to office, you know, we go to online, we watch movies. There's always temptation either to steal, to be violent, to be aggressive, to, to pass comments, to be racist, to, to be, to, you know, to uh, retort in anger. So much temptations everywhere we go. Now in the street she looks. Now in the squares and every corner she looks. She took hold of him and kissed him and with a brazen face she said. So sometimes, many times, they'll come and directly on your face and approach you also. And with a brazen face, brazen means like bronze, like, you know, like a firm, uh, firm face, confident face. She said, today I fulfill my vows. vows. I, I have food for my fellowship offering at home. So she's making spiritual, sounding very spiritual. I fulfill my vows. Yeah. I have uh, food for my fellowship offering at home. Okay, food, very nice. So I came out to meet you. Okay, making you sound uh, very precious, very important. Right? Everybody loves to feel important. So look at the way this person talks. I came out to meet you. I looked for you and found you. Say so much about you. And then I covered my bed with colorful linen from Egypt. Okay, it's talking about pleasure and relaxation and you know, Egypt. Uh, it's you know, imported items. I perfume my bed on with myrrh, aloe, and cinnamon. Okay, so all the senses. Right? You feel nice, you smell nice, you look nice, you eat nice, you uh, you you know, you are being uh, seduced in every sense. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. So again, uh, not only a pleasure, but also he says that no, no, there's no fear, right? No repercussions. Whatever it'll be happening in secret, nobody will know. See, my, my husband is not home. He has gone on a long journey, right? He's not going to suddenly pop up. So you're not going to run off. He took his purse filled with money. He will not be home till full moon. That's about a month's time, right? So much time. So with persuasive words, she led him astray. With persuasive words. So this is how you we get persuaded. So all these kind of enticement, right? All the pleasures promised, all the uh, honor, dignity, you know, recognition is offered to you, right? All the promises of wealth and riches, and also the absence of fear and punishment, right? Repercussions, it will not happen to you. Don't worry, nothing will happen. See, be it not only sex, okay, not only adultery or fornication, but in everything, be it your job, your career, your relationships, your Whatever, think about it. It all the same method is being utilized. The same method, same technique will be used. Yeah. Now, verse 21. With persuasive pers with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him. She seduced her with smooth talk. Smooth talk. Like our marketing industry today. Right? Marketing companies spend billions of dollars just on marketing. And example, Coca-Cola. What do they sell? Aerated sugar water which kills you in the long run. But they have spent billions of dollars on marketing. You know, they put all these actors and actresses and sports people and all these people drinking Coke and dancing and, you know, doing sports and doing healthy activities, ironically. And so you look at them and say, we want to be like them. We want to be hot. We want to be cool. We want to be accepted. We want to be so on and so forth. And so we get seduced into it. And long run, our money is drained and the health is drained as well. A small example. Verse 22. All at once, she followed her. Like an ox going to the slaughter. Like a deer stepping into a noose. Like an arrow pierces his liver. Like an arrow pierces his liver. Like a bird darting into a snare. Little knowing it will cost him his life. Let's not be this guy. Okay, Let's not be that ox, that deer, that, that liver, or that bird. And walk into sin. It starts slowly, creeps in, but it's going to build up. We're almost done. 
Verse 24. Now then, my son, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Again, the repetition. Pay attention, pay attention. Listen, listen. And uh, in old Hebrew, you know, uh, there was no separate word for obey, I would say. Uh, but because the word listen implied obey. Right? It's a very encompassing word. The moment I say listen, it doesn't mean trying to understand what you're saying. Right? Right? Sometimes in English we say, can you hear that sound? It's like, I can hear a sound. Can you listen? It's like, and then I listen. It's like, oh, sounds like somebody is saying this. But in Hebrew, it goes further and says, listen means obey. You know, do it. Okay. So, do this. Now, my sons, obey me. Pay attention to what I say. Put your full attention. Do not let your hearts turn to her path, turn to her ways, or strain to her path. So, avoid these temptations. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading to the chambers of death. Scary, but many people have gone through it. And no matter how many warnings come our way, people are still doing it. So King Solomon here speaks to all men, especially, remember this, King Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines, correct? I think, yes, which, I think, which way around? 300 wives or 300 uh, concubines, whatever. He had a lot of women in his life. And speaking after years of experience, he has realized that women can lead him astray. Now, go, let me put, let me rephrase this. Ungodly women, okay? Not women, <laughs> godless women. Even godless men, of course. But here he's speaking specifically to his sons who will be kings one day. Right? They will be leaders of community and of the nation of God. So what he's saying is, beware. Because you are supposed to sell, not sell. You're supposed to submit your heart, mind, body, soul, everything to the kingdom of heaven. And one of the easiest, most dangerous and slippery way of destruction is through the lust for women. Right? Lust for women. Because women... A lust for women is the whole package. Like we saw just now. This seductive woman offered her, offered him food, right? Offered him uh, pleasure, rest, security, uh, uh, dignity, respect, you know? Because she called him out by name and uh, gave her, gave him re respect and all that stuff. So men, by the way, look for respect. Okay, by, I hope women, men both realize this. One of the greatest things that men look subconsciously is respect. Dignity and respect. It's in us. It's a God-given thirst within men to have dignity and respect. For women, it is love. Tender, loving, tenderness is what women look for from men. But for men, the way into a man's heart. Girls, if you're looking to marry someone, please understand this. Men look for, ultimately, they look for self-respect and dignity. Right? And this is what destroys men also. When you take them, remove dignity and self-respect from them. Okay? No matter how rich they may be or powerful even they may be, or uh, well-educated or whatever, if they lose respect and dignity and honor, they have lost something in their souls. Okay, So, seductresses of all kinds would also offer this package. Of, initially. Then, of course, they will, once you have fallen in the trap, they will crash and destroy you and, you know, humiliate you and destroy you. But uh, this is the encouragement, especially for young men, They're very pertinent in the age today. I am uh, ministering counseling to men of all ages and uh, sexual sin, even among women, but yes, even among men, is very one of the greatest weapons Satan has utilized in this modern age, especially to the advent of the internet. So we must be, be careful what we let into our eyes and ears and how what we spend our time and energy on because that is uh, where it will lead us. So thank you very much. Today was Proverbs chapter 6 and 7. Next week, we will try and do great uh, chapter 8 and 9. Tomorrow, we will be doing James. And day after, we will be doing uh, Genesis. So I encourage you to continue to review. And uh, if you have missed out uh, uh, previous chapters, I put a few of them online. They are on the channel. So please do watch them. Uh, it's good to continue. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, teaching has really helped me. You know, it has forced me to learn. Teaching, this is one, this is why I want to do this Bible study because it has forced me to learn. So when I have this responsibility of teaching the word of God, it has made me learn, transform me. And very interestingly, also, uh, when I've been doing Genesis, uh, James, Genesis, James, Proverbs, and I'm studying Matthew, you know, I see a common thread in all of this, you know. So it's really opened my eyes to uh, the unity of the scriptures. 
So I encourage you to do parallel Bible studies as well. And it will really bless you in so many levels. So thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, I'll just end the recording for now. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, did I end already? Okay. Oh. Cancel? Okay. Uh, everybody? Okay, anyway. So I'll edit this later. Thank you everyone for joining me. Is there anything in, we can pray for together? I'll, I'll really appreciate that. And if you can turn on your screen for a moment. I have a, we have a few friends here who have joined us. I hope you're all doing well. Ah, Dr. Jeffy, good to see you. Mom Kim, very nice. Yeah. Let's go. Yes, Ajay. Okay, Sister Manjula. Yes. Yes, very good. We are here from uh, many corners of the world and many corners of the country. Uh, praise God for internet, isn't it? It's a yes. powerful <laughs> tool. No. <laughs> Unless if I said, come to my house, nobody will come, okay? <laughs> Even if I offer you naga food or something like that. <laughs> but here we are in the comfort of a home sitting together. So let me pray for all of us. And uh, and let me just put forward to you again. Um, I myself and my wife were available for you. If you need prayer, counsel, advice, help, anytime you have our numbers, please reach out to us. We're here for you. Okay. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful gathering today of all my brothers and sisters from all parts of this uh, great nation and beyond. Why thank you? I thank you, Father, that they have a thirst to know you and to obey you, O oh Lord. So I pray right now, as you have promised five times in the scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts and beyond, that you will give us your Holy Spirit to enable us to, give, to live the Christian life, to live the new life you've given to us, I ask now that you'll fill every one of my brothers and sisters here with the fruit, with inflow, with a refilling of the cup of the Holy Spirit. Give them new grace, new strength, new wisdom, new understanding, promotion in the Spirit. Lord, Father, fill their cup, oh God. Fill their cup here and now. And we pray, oh Lord, that you'll, they will walk with wisdom, with truth, with knowledge and instruction with understanding and discernment <clears throat> all the days of their life. And we bless them in their business, in their studies, in their interactions, in their pursuits, in their hobbies. I bless them in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I pray also for peace in their homes and in their houses, oh God. You'll, we pray to you, Heavenly Father, that you hear from heaven and grant peace and shalom and rest and success and productivity and prosperity to all my brothers and sisters who are here with me in here and now. Thank you, Father, for you have heard our prayers. For we pray this by faith in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank Praise you, everyone, Lord. for joining me. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So I will catch you next tomorrow or whenever you're free. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.